Uh, what I usually do at my clinics is try to join the dots for people and take everything they've ever been told and get them to realise that everybody does everything the same, not everything, everybody does everything that's different, you know what I mean? But I'm here today to talk about why I do groundwork and um, I'm sure if you've seen other people's groundwork, they'll tell you why they do groundwork and they've given you a really good reason for it. But I really, I really truly think there's an underlying reason for a lot of this groundwork stuff. And um, who's been and seen, say, Clinton do some stuff? Yeah, okay, so Clinton talks about there's only two things you're doing. You are desensitizing your horse or you are sensitizing your horse. Everybody understands that? You're either getting them to not respond to the thing you're doing, which would be this, or getting them to respond to the thing you're doing, which is that. And for me, probably, you know, there's, there's two parts to the groundwork. There's the sensitizing, desensitizing, but there's two reasons for the groundwork. And one of them is the mental or emotional side of this whole thing and one is the physical side and I'm going to mostly today address the emotional side of the groundwork, what it actually does for these horses because you know I um, deal with a lot of problem horses and almost every horse's problem, the problem itself, the rearing, the bucking, the bolting or whatever is caused by anxiety and so uh, to me it's almost like anxiety is the, the big bad thing from all of them and and uh, you know, it doesn't matter if it's the anxiety of your horse, you know, you go for a trial ride and a horse, all the other horses gallop off over the hill and your horse says, oh, I'm anxious about being here alone, I'd rather go off with them. Who's ever experienced that one? You know, that one's pretty common. Um, all sorts of different things that horses have anxiety over. Speaking of anxiety, does anybody here know anybody with anxiety or have anxiety yourself? Does anybody here know anybody who has panic attacks? Okay, so my wife has panic attacks. When we first got married, I didn't realize she had panic attacks and we'd been married a couple of months and she had a panic attack about two o'clock in the morning and she wakes me up and says, <laughs> you know, that is, you know, something wrong, take me to the hospital. I go, well, what's wrong, do you, do you hurt somewhere? She goes, no, 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 no. Just, just take me to the hospital. Yeah, but what's wrong? Oh, there's something wrong. What exactly do you hurt? No, but okay, I think I'm married to a crazy lady. Okay, so I take her to the hospital and we get there and because I didn't know what anxiety was, I didn't know what panic attacks was and she'd never told me that. And so we get to the hospital and this doctor looks her over. We're going to need doctors here. No doctors. Um, a doctor looks her over and so he's had four years of pre-med, four years of medical school, four years as a resident, and by judging by his age, he's probably had about 14 years of doctoring. So he's got like 28 years of medical experience. And he takes her pulse and feels her heart and does an EKG and, you know, picks her up and picks the front feet up and does a few stretches with her. And he, go, he looks her in the eye and he said, there is absolutely nothing wrong with you. And you know what she did? She looked at me and she said, I'm going to die. <laughs> okay? When you are having a panic attack, the only person who can help you is you. No one else can help you. And it's kind of the same thing with these horses. When these horses are worried about stuff, unless they can, they can regulate themselves, there's not much whole lot you can do from them. Like, oh, stop it, don't be stupid, it's just a kangaroo jumping out of the bushes. It isn't going to hurt, it isn't going to help. You know what I mean? And so, my wife has always had panic attacks, and doing this groundwork stuff, like I said before, there's your sensitizing, your desensitizing, and what you are doing with this stuff is, you know, if you just desensitize a horse a lot, your horse is going to be really quiet, isn't he? But he's going to be really dull and lazy. And if you sensitize him a lot, he's going to be really responsive, but he's going to be on edge, isn't he? He's going to be anxious. And so your job is to get him quiet, but when you get him properly quiet, they will be a bit dull. So now you're going to get him responsive, but when you get him responsive, now they're going to be a bit anxious. And so now you've got to get him quiet again. And when you get him quiet again, now they're dull, and now I've got to get him responsive again, but now they're 
anxious and it goes backwards and forwards and a lot of people think, oh, I'm not doing it right or whatever. That's perfectly normal. That's what you've got to do and you keep going backwards and forwards between one and the other and then one day your horse will be quiet and responsive at the same time. And that's what you're trying to get. So this is Bundy, he's a four year old. He um, broke uh, his P2, his paston bone when he was uh, a two year old. So he spent like four months in a stall in a cast and then was hand walked and went to the rehab center. And, and as you can tell, he's been out in the mud rubbing his mane off on the fence at home. I haven't worked with him terribly much. And he's, he's a bit of a, not a worried sort of a horse, but pretty energetic sort of a horse. But you can see here in this, he's never been away from home before, and you can see in this kind of surrounding here, he's controlling himself quite well, and I attribute that to the groundwork that's been done with him in the past. Um, but anyway, so with that groundwork, you, you know, if you think about Bundy today, he is relaxed. Now this is the responsive part, Bundy, this is where you're supposed to thank you. Let's try that again. So he's, let's, let's, let's see if we can try that again, Bundy. So, are you relaxed? Close enough. Are you responsive? Ah, very good. Can you go from being responsive back to being well, that's very good. That's that's kind of what you're trying to get these horses to do, and that will cover 99% of your problems that you have with with different things. Does anybody here do dressage? Come on, it's okay. You can raise your hand. There you go. I've got one. Um, what is the main set of exercises you do in dressage to teach collection? If there was one word, the main set of exercises. Now that's, that's a result of doing this set of exercises. What are this set of exercises? Sounds like transmissions, but it's not transmissions. <laughs> transitions. So what do you do? You do lots of upward and downward transitions and the horse has to go from one state to another state, like a car, you know, like if he's walking, he's walking. And think about this. You're riding a green horse and you ask him to trot. He's just trotting, isn't he? And you ask him to walk, and now he's just walking. And you want him to trot. Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Oh, good, now I'm trotting. Now walk. Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Oh, now I'm walking again. But the more transitions you do, after a while those horses trot with the intention they may have to walk, and they walk with the intention and have to trot. And that's collection, isn't it? You don't ask for collection initially. You've got to teach a horse how to collect. After a while, you can basically ask for an upward and a downward transition at the same time, and you have collection. But you can't ask for it without teaching it first, can you? And you have to go from a walk to a trot, to a walk, to a trot, okay? You can't go from a walk to a collected walk. You can't say, I'm only going to walk this horse. So it's kind of the same thing with this groundwork stuff. You can't go from quiet and dull to quiet and responsive. You're going to go from quiet and dull to responsive, but anxious. Good. Don't, don't go, oh no, he's all worried now. Go, good. Now it's time to get him back over the line. Go get him quiet again. Oh, but now he's dull. Now I've got to get him responsive. I want to get him properly responsive. Oh, but now he's anxious. Good. And you've got to keep going backwards and forwards. And just like with your dressage, one day you go to do a downward transition from a trot to a walk. And up until that point in time, every time you went from a trot to a walk, it was from a trot to a walk. And one day you trot along and you ask him to walk and he goes, and you feel that hit you in the bum and you go, oh, that's the feeling I'm looking for. What day is that? It's a good day, but when is that day? <laughs> is he playing Philly Buggers behind my back? When is that day? You don't know when that day is. It just appears, doesn't it? It's the same thing with this. How much groundwork till my horse is good? I don't know. As long as it takes when you can get your horse to go from one state to another and back to that state. So, getting back to my wife and her anxiety, she's always had panic attacks, and I've always talked about this up and down stuff at clinics. Well, early last year, I came home from a clinic and she said, hey, I was, I was listening to this podcast online and there was this guy doing this cognitive behavior therapy. Has anybody ever heard of cognitive behavior therapy? 
this guy doing this cognitive behaviour therapy for anxiety and what I'm supposed to do is one day when I'm really relaxed I should sit in my chair, close my eyes and think about something that bothers me just a little bit. It gets me a bit uptight. In her case she's got this little dog she loves, it'd be him being sick maybe, you know what I mean? And so she thinks about this dog being uptight and then you now her heart starts kind of going thump, 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 thump. and now she's got to focus on her breathing slow breathing until she gets back to completely relaxed again and then what's she supposed to do? close her eyes and do it again and then get herself back down get herself up, get herself down, get herself up, get herself down and if she worked on a small thing one day and by the end of the thing she could close her eyes, think about it and she stayed relaxed, be a good thing, you could finish come back the next day, do it again and once that was good you could go okay now I'm going to think about my dog being really sick and so on and so forth and it's supposed to be practicing getting yourself a bit worried and getting yourself out of being a bit worried so that you have some practice when you, when, when you come to having a panic attack. So, so I've been telling that story all last year at clinics so my wife knows this cognitive behaviour therapy thing. Okay? So I'd come home and I'd go you've been practicing and she goes oh no not yet. <laughs> I'm like well it's not going to help you don't practice. And every time I come home from a clinic, which is a lot, I'm, you know, I did 44 clinics last year, so that's a lot of coming home saying, hey, did you practice that thing yet? No, I haven't practiced yet. So every time I asked her, she hasn't practiced. I don't think she has a problem with it. She's not a very good flyer. She's kind of nervous on planes. So what do you think would be the worst thing that could happen to my wife? Panic attack on a plane. That would be just overwhelming, wouldn't it? I mean, when she has a panic attack normally, you can't control her. She can't control herself. And when she's on a plane, she's always worried. So that'd be the worst thing in the world. So last year, I did a bit of a tour across Canada. And we flew from somewhere in Alberta to um, Ontar Tron Toronto, Ontario. And it's about a two and a half hour flight. And as usual, when the plane started up, I went to sleep. And when the plane went boing, boing, when it landed, I woke up. And I turned and look at Robin, and she's kind of a little bit white, you know, a little pale. And I go, are you OK? She goes, well, that was a bit rough. And I said, oh, we had some turbulence, did we? She said, no, I had a panic attack. And right then I started thinking, do I have any skin left on my face? Because, like, this woman, if she had a panic attack on a plane, she would, you know, tear the skin off me and the seat covers off. And I feel fine. I said, so what did you do when you had the panic attack? She goes, well, I've been practicing that um, cognitive behaviour therapy stuff and as soon as I started to have the panic attack, I focused on my breathing and it went away. And that there is the moral to this whole story today is people go, well, I've got this four-year-old horse at home and I've been invited to go to um, uh, equine, not equine Affair, sorry, Western States Horse Expo and, and perform in front of a crowd of people on noisy bleachers Anyway, how do I get used to that? <laughs> My wife didn't have a, a Boeing 747 to practice her, her anxiety on. Do you guys get what I'm talking about here? She got herself under controlled circumstances. She got herself up, she got herself down, she got herself up, she got herself down. When she started to have the panic attack on the plane, She'd never practiced that. She had the ability to get herself back down. And, and it's really about being able to regulate your emotions. And most horses, when you know, people go, so I was trail riding the other day and all the other horses galloped off over the hill and my horse freaked out and I couldn't get it unfreaked out. What should I have done? My answer is usually, well, how's your groundwork? Because that's what this thing is about today, groundwork. I'll say, how's your groundwork? And they go, dear Warwick, no, you weren't listening. I was on a trail ride and the other horses ran over the hill and my horse got all wound up and I couldn't unwind him. How should I have done? Once again, my question is, how is your groundwork? How is your groundwork means, how is your horse's mental coping skills at coming down from being up? Can your horse get down from being up? If it can't get down from being up with something you have control over, it's not going to get down from being up something you don't have control of. Does that make sense there? You know, what my wife doesn't do when she practices that thing, what she shouldn't do is close her eyes and think about um, 
Oh, what was that movie with The Rock in recently about the earthquake? What was it called? San Andreas. You know, we live on the San Andreas Fault up there in Northern California. So she shouldn't close her eyes and think about what if the world came to an end today? <laughs> it's not going to work. She starts thinking about her dog being sick. What shouldn't she think about? Chocolate. Okay? It's not going to work if she goes, chocolate, chocolate. <sighs> oh, I'm good. Does that make sense? There was a lady at a clinic in Australia one time and she says, my horse does all the groundwork really good, desensitised really good, but when the kangaroos jump out of the bushes when I'm on a trial ride, he freaks out, what should I do? And I say, well, show me your desensitising. And she goes, okay. <laughs> and I said, oh, that's perfect. As long as... The kangaroos, they see her come, see you coming, they go, okay guys, it's the horse that you can't move very fast, so no hopping. Front feet, back feet. Front feet, back feet. No hopping with this horse. The world doesn't work that way. Does that make sense? And so you, what you're trying to, what are you, I'm trying to do a lot in this groundwork, and everybody's doing in this groundwork, whether they explain it as sensitizing, desensitizing. Richard Winners is here, he's amazing, and Oh, he's been around for a long time and he wrote something about 15 years ago that made a lot of sense to me. And He says, your horse has to have equal amounts of trust and respect. The desensitizing, whoops, the desensitizing, this is trust and I'm not going to do anything to him. But if I take this lead rope and I point it across there like that, that's respect. They've got to have equal amounts of both. And so Richard will talk about that. I'm sure Clinton talks about that. Um, if you guys are Pirelli followers, you know, you talk about the, the, uh, oh, I had this memorised before I came in, the, uh, the, sorry, the friendly game, and then the porcupine game or whatever, but you know, the things that don't, they shouldn't move from, the things they should move from, it's all the same thing, but if you think about what's really going on apart from the physical part of it, is the mental part of it, you're having these horses practice getting up and getting down. I mean, if anybody's ever had a life coach help you read any of those sorts of books or whatever, one of the things they say in order for you to grow as a person is every day you should do something that scares you a little. Anybody ever heard that? Do you think your horse has read that book? <laughs> you are going to have to be the person to do something to him that scares him a little and then show him how to get over it. But, but, but by not doing that, he's not going to get over it. Does everybody get what I'm talking about there? And so all this groundwork stuff is, um, you know, you think about it, it's just like that, it's basically, for me, it's cognitive behaviour therapy for horses. It is, you know, it is getting this side of the equation, getting them up and getting them down. I'm the one that's going to get them up and I'm the one that's going to get them down, okay? How do you get them up? Is you get them responsive. And